Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in which we are discussing the Glucial channel. Okay, so we've now discussed the transmembrane domain of um, the Glucial channel, we've discussed the intracellular domain, finally let's discuss the extracellular domain, and let's discuss uh, ligand binding to the extracellular domain. Okay, so the extracellular domain is made up of the portion that is prior to M1 of each of these five glucial 1 receptor subunits, which makes up the glucial receptor, which is a homopentamer. So each one of these has this pre-M1 region, and that's on the extracellular aspect. And the five of these together make the extracellular domain of the glucial channel. Okay, now... What we want to discuss is our ligand binding to these glucial channels and the process of opening. So the extracellular domain is the portion that is responsible for glutamate, the natural ligand for this receptor binding. So when glutamate binds, what will happen to the receptor? Well, basically what will happen is that you will move the M2 alpha helices out, basically so that the lumen of the tube, the size of the pore through uh, the glucial channel, will increase, okay? That will move uh, the um, leucine residues at position 9 prime, the threonine residues at position 2 prime, and the proline residues at position negative 2 prime. It will move all of those rings outward so that you create a better... Uh, a larger sized tube down the middle so that the ions can move through basically so you're going to open all three of those gates now the receptor actually doesn't just have two states though so let's go through this so initially what it is in is it's in the closed but resting state so this is written closed and then you put a forward slash resting like that so this is the state where the uh, glucial channel has no ligand bound to it, okay? Um, but it's not open. So it doesn't, it's not open, but it has no ligand bound to it. So the M2 alpha helices are nice and close together in this ring, and they have these three rings, one of leucines, one of threonines, and one of prolines, which are blocking the uh, pore, and no uh, chloride anions can move through. Then... When ligand binds, so this is the process of ligand binding. So when ligand binds to the closed channel, what's going to happen is that um, is that the receptor opens. So it's going to go into the open state, okay? And that what then is going to happen is that the M two alpha helices are all going to move outwards, and that means that these three circles, the circle of leucine residues, the circle of, um, of what's the middle one, threonine residues, and the circle of uh, proline residues, they all move outwards, and then uh, chloride anions will be able to move in. However, there's a third state. So actually, firstly, let's just talk, continue talking about this. What can then happen is the open state can go back to the closed state, and what will trigger that is ligand unbinding. So if you lose the ligand, then you'll go from being in the open state back to in the being in the closed state. So ligand binding takes you into the open state. Uh, ligand unbinding will take you back into the closed slash resting state. However, there's another state, a third state. So the ligand binds, it converts it into this open state. But what can happen is you can go from the open state to being in another closed state, but this is not the closed resting state. This is what's known as the closed desensitized state. And am I going to have room to squash this in down here? Desensitized. There we go. Okay, so it goes into the closed desensitized state. And this is the state where the channel closes back down but it still has ligand bound to it, so the ligand will still be bound. The glutamate, let's say, will still be there, but it's no longer open. It closes back down, even though the ligand's bound to it. And it can move back. It can move from the closed desensitized state to the open state. So basically, when you have a glucial channel, let's imagine that we just have such a high glutamate concentration that there pretty much is always glutamate bound to that glucial channel. Okay, then 
What will happen is the blue CL channel will not be in the open state continuously. Instead, it will be flipping between the open and the closed desensitized state. So it will spend a little bit of time in the open state, then it will go into closed desensitized state, then it will go back to the open state, and this is all when there's a constant glutamate bound to that glue CL channel. Of course, if you remove the glutamate suddenly, what can then happen is it will go back to the closed resting state. Uh, but if the glutamate remains bound, it doesn't just remain open all the time. It flips between this open and this closed desensitized state. So basically, it's almost like there are two states here. There's this state of being in the closed resting state, and then there's this state of flipping between the open and the closed desensitized state. So again, there's a link between the closed and resting and closed desensitized. So going from the closed resting to the closed desensitized requires ligand to bind, okay? And going the other way, i.e. from closed desensitized to closed resting, requires ligand unbinding, okay? So this one requires ligand unbinding. So I urge you to think of this as um, there are two states, effectively, this closed resting state, and then if ligand binds, it goes to this state where it's flipping between being in the open state and being in the closed desensitized state. Okay, right. So, that's the endogenous function of this channel. So, when glutamate binds to this channel on a neuron, let's say, it's going to open this channel. It will go into the open state, where it will be flipping between the open and the closed desensitized state. But the point is, it will be in this open state for at least some time. And it will allow chloride anions to move in from the extracellular space into uh, the intracellular fluid. And those chloride anions will reduce the electrical potential of the intracellular fluid. And that means that you will hyperpolarize the electrical potential difference across the membrane of the cell. Right. OK, so now let's discuss the drugs ivermectin and also another molecule that can bind to um, these glucial channels, which is known as POPC. So we'll start with POPC uh, because ivermectin is bigger, basically. I've got more to say about ivermectin. So we'll start with POPC. All right, so let me get another piece of paper because I want to show you the structure of POPC. So, POPC then, it stands basically for one palmitoil, okay, uh, two oleoil, okay, and then uh, SN glycero free phosphocholine. And don't worry, I will guide you through why it is called that. So, this stands for one palmitoil, whoops, what am I doing here? Palmitoil, free oleoil. Sorry, not free oleoil, two oleoil, two oleoil, which is an oleic acid group. And then uh, we have the SN, which refers to the optical isomer of it. We won't worry about that too much. Uh, glycero, which means glycerol. And then on the end, free phosphocholine. So free phosphocholine. So this initial P here is for palmitoil. The O is for oleoil. And then the PC on the end is for phosphocholine. Right, so let's draw the structure of this molecule. So we'll start with these two things here. We'll start with palmitoil and oleoil. Okay, so palmitoil basically means that you have a styrified palmitic acid onto the first hydroxyl group of your glycerol. So what's the structure of palmitic acid? Okay, so palmitic acid is a 16-carbon, uh, fully saturated carboxylic acid. So here's the carboxylic acid group here. Okay, and you need 16 carbons. So this is the first one. You then are going to have 14 in the middle, which are in methylene groups. And then the final one will be a methyl group on the end. So because I don't want to have to draw 14 methylene groups, there is a clever trick to get around this. You draw one methylene group and then put a bracket around it and then put a 14 at the bottom. So that's a clever trick to get around having to uh, draw 14 methylene groups. And then on the end, you'll have to draw the final methyl group. 
Okay, so there's the final methyl group. So we now overall have 16 carbons there. We have the 14 that are in the methylene groups in the middle, the 15th here, and the 16th here. So this is the structure of palmitic acid. Okay, now let's talk about oleic acid. So oleic acid next. Oleic acid is a uh, sorry, an 18 carbon carboxylic acid, and it's not fully saturated, so it has one double bond in it. So here is the, uh, the first uh, carbon, the carboxylic acid group. Then what you have is seven methylene groups, which I'm going to uh, draw straight away. Okay, so seven here, which I'll put one like, one methylene group and then put the brackets around it and put seven. Then you have the ninth carbon here. So this double bond basically is perfectly in the middle of the molecule. So here's the first carbon. You've then got seven here, so that takes us up to eight. This is the ninth one, so we're halfway along. And between the ninth and the tenth one, which are the two middle carbons, you have this double bond, like so. Okay, so there you just have a single hydrogen off. And then off here, you then have another seven methylene groups. So this takes us up to 17 carbons now. So here are these seven methylene groups. And then right on the end, you just have a methyl group. So this is the structure of oleic acid. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to take a glycerol molecule. So I will draw, uh, actually I suppose I should show you what phosphocholine is first. Uh, and then I'll show you uh, how we put the whole thing together. Because basically we're just going to take glycerol, we're going to add on a palmitic acid group, we're going to add on an oleol, we won't worry about the SN, that just refers to the optical isomer, and then we've got a phosphocholine on the end, of the on the third hydroxyl group. So let's discuss what phosphocholine is. So we'll start with what choline is. Choline is an alcohol basically, and this is the choline that you have in acetylcholine. Um, but in acetylcholine, you have esterified the choline alcohol with an acetic acid group, whereas in phosphocholine, you formed a phosphoester link between a phosphate group and a choline molecule. Okay, so let's have a look at the structure of the choline alcohol. So what you have is these two carbons, like so, okay, and then you have an alcohol group off here, and nitrogen here, and then three methyl groups off this nitrogen here. Okay, and nitrogen's only supposed to have three bonds. So in one of these bonds, the nitrogen will have provided both electrons, and that means it's effectively given away one of its electrons, uh, so it gains a positive charge. Right, so uh, that's the structure of the choline alcohol. To turn it into a phosphocholine molecule, let's put the phosphate group here. So the phosphorus atom, double bonded to an oxygen with two alcohol groups on and then single bonded to another oxygen here. Right, so how then do you bind these two together? Well basically you can form a phosphoester link by removing the alcohol group of the phosphate group, removing the hydrogen of the alcohol group, binding them together to make water, which is why this is called a condensation reaction. So this is a condensation reaction. Okay, and then what you will do is you will link the phosphorus atom to the oxygen atom of the next, of the choline molecule over here. And that will create you a phosphoester link, also known as a phosphate ester link. So this is a phosphoester link. Okay, between a phosphate group and the choline molecule. And that whole molecule now that you have created, that is known as phosphocholine. Okay, so what we're now going to do is we're going to put all of these molecules onto a glycerol molecule to create our POPC molecule, our 1 palmitoyl 2 oleoil uh, SN glycero 3 phosphocholine. So, glycerol then is this free carbon molecule here where you have these um, free alcohol groups. I'll draw the glycerol pure at first. So, three alcohol groups, one off each of the carbons. So, strictly speaking, its full name is propane, uh, since it's a free carbon molecule, 1, 2, 3, trial, 
to take account of the free alcohol groups. So this is glycerol, okay? And in full, its name is propane, which is just the name for the free carbon, hydrocarbon, and then one, two, three, uh, triol, to denote these free alcohol groups that you have off the carbon uh, structure. Okay, then what you do is you're going to link the palmitic acid molecule onto this uh, first alcohol group here. So you're going to form a normal ester link between the carboxylic acid group of the palmitic acid and this alcohol group of the first carbon of the glycerol molecule. So basically, off this one, what you're going to do is take that hydrogen off, and then it's going to be linked to palmitic acid. Okay? Right, and I haven't got really space to draw it, so I'll just write palmitic acid. So that hydrogen now has been scratched off, so that's gone. <coughs> okay, and then off this alcohol, the second alcohol group, you'll link the oleic acid group. So this is going to be oleic acid here, and again you'll take the hydrogen off. And again it will be just a normal uh, ester link between the carboxylic acid group of the oleic acid molecule and the alcohol group of this second carbon of the glycerol molecule. And finally, you'll then take uh, the hydrogen off this final third carbon and link it in a phosphoester link to the uh, phosphate group of the phosphocholine molecule. So the phosphate group of the phosphocholine molecule still has this free alcohol group here. That will come off, the hydrogen will come off here to make water, and that oxygen will link to that phosphorus atom uh, to make you uh, the final molecule. So you'll then have phosphocholine written here. So, one palmitoyl, because palmitic acid, when you've got it stuck on something, is known as a palmitoyl group, Two oleoil, because when you've got oleic acid stuck on something, it's known as an oleoil group. SN refers to the fact that this carbon here is a chiral center, okay, because it's got four separate groups coming off it. So you'll have two optical isomers of it, but we won't dwell on that. And then glycero, short for glycerol, and then free phosphocholine. So that's our POPC molecule. Okay, and what's going to happen is POPC is also an agonist for these glucial channels. It will bind to these glucial channels and cause them to open. Now, let me just show you where it's actually going to bind on these glucial channels. Okay, so we have, um, where have we, here, this structure here where we've got the uh, four membrane-spanning alpha helices like so. Basically, what you find is that POPC binds in between the two neighboring M2 alpha helices. It binds over here. So this here in green, oh god, it's gone black. Um, this here in black, uh, I've just cleaned off my highlighter, I think. Um, this is the binding site of POPC, and it causes the channel to open. And I want to stress that you won't just have one POPC binding, you'll have them binding in all of these little crevices. And I'd also like to um, also point out that the binding site of glutamate or to the extracellular domains of the um, glucial channel is between extracellular domains of neighboring subunits. So basically, it will, uh, the binding site for glutamate will be formed by the extracellular domain of one subunit neighboring the other one. So you'll have the binding sites in between the two subunits. Okay, and the different subunits provide different motifs into the binding site. And because of that, one is known as the positive subunit, and this one here will be the positive subunit for this binding site here. So this will be called the positive subunit because um, it's providing this M2 and M3 alpha helices sort of on this side. And this subunit which provides the M1 alpha helix in, this will be called the negative subunit. They also have other names. So some people will refer to the positive subunit as the principal subunit and then the negative subunit as the comp complementary subunit. So basically, all of these agonists, glutamate, uh, POPC, and ivermectin, which we haven't seen yet, but we will do, 
they all bind in between two of the subunits. They're binding sites are between the two subunits. In this case, uh, POPCs is in this crevice between the M2 alpha helices. In the case of glutamate, it was between the two extracellular domains of these subunits, okay? Uh, and because of that, the two subunits are going to provide in different motifs. So if we're looking specifically at this binding site here, this one will be considered the positive subunit, and this one will be the negative subunit. And I want to stress that this is specific to which binding subunit you're looking at. If we went and looked at this binding site here, this one which was previously the positive subunit, that's now providing in the M1 alpha helix, so it will be a negative subunit for this binding site here, and this one now, which is providing the M1 and the M2, this will be the positive subunit. So uh, every single subunit will be a positive subunit on one side, this side, uh, this side here basically for it, and a negative subunit on the other side. Okay, so you'll have five binding sites overall for each agonist. So in the next video, what we'll turn our attention to is ivermectin.